Well, hello there, and welcome to my podcast. I'm Cory Doctorow, and I'm reading to you from my 2005 novel, Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town. Well, not a very eventful week since I last spoke to you. Um, the, I think I mentioned last time there is uh, some rumbling about a Little Brother film, and my film agent and book agent who are working on it together tell me that it's going very well. But nothing is final till it's vinyl, as they say. So uh, I've got no... Uh, I'm trying to be very zen about it. Uh, it will happen or it won't, and there's nothing I can do to make a difference, so I'm just keeping very calm about it. Um, I am getting uh, all booked up to go to Detroit, to go to Confusion, uh, Cryptic Confusion, on the uh, it's the 23rd, 24th, and 25th of January, uh, and um, I'm hoping to see some of you there. Uh, it's always nice when I when I go and do a reading or, or a panel and I meet people who listen to the podcast. Please do come up and say hello if you if you find yourself there. If I sound a little exhausted, it's because Poesy, my nearly one-year-old daughter, is getting her one-year molars just a little early. Uh, the first one broke through the skin last night, I think around four o'clock, judging by the howls. And uh, we did get her to sleep, but she was up again this morning at 3, and uh, between my wife and I, we were up more or less from about 3 or 3.30. And I'm a little exhausted. But never let it be said that uh, exhaustion will stop me from podcasting to you. Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town, Part 2. Once the bookcases were seated and screwed into the walls, out came the books, thousands of them, tens of thousands of them. Little kids' books with loose signatures, ancient first edition hardcovers, outsized novelty art books, mass market paperbacks, reference books as thick as cinder blocks. They were mostly used when he'd gotten them, and that was what he loved most about them. They smelled like other people, and their pages contained hints of their lives. Marginalia and pawn tickets, bus transfers gone yellow with age, and smears of long-ago meals. When he read them, he was in three places. His living room, the author's heads, and the world of their previous owners. They came off his shelves at home, from the ten-by-ten storage down on the lakeshore. They came from friends and enemies who'd borrowed his books years before, but who'd forgotten to return them. But Alan never forgot. He kept every book in a great and deep relational database that had begun as a humble flat file, but which had been imported into successive generations of industrial-grade database software. This, in turn, was but a pocket in the Ur database, the inventory, in which Alan had input the value, the cost, the salient features, the unique identifiers, the photographic record of every single thing he owned, from the socks in his sock drawer to the pots in his cupboard. Maintaining the inventory was serious business, no less important now than it had been when he had begun it in the course of securing insurance for his bookshop. Alan was an insurance man's worst nightmare, a customer from hell who'd messenger over five banker's boxes of detailed cross-referenced inventory at the slightest provocation. The books filled the shelves, row on row, behind the dust-proof, light-proof glass doors. The books began in the foyer and wrapped around the living room, covered the wall behind the dining room, in the kitchen, filled the den in the master bedroom and the master bath, climbed the short walls to the dormer ceilings on the third floor. They were organized by idiosyncratic subject categories and alphabetical by author within those categories. Alan's father was a mountain, and his mother was a washing machine. He kept a roof over their heads, and she kept their clothes clean. His brothers were, a dead man, a trio of nesting dolls, a fortune teller, and an island. He had only two or three family portraits, but he treasured them, even if outsiders who saw them often mistook them for landscapes. There was, there was one where his family stood on his father's slopes, mom out in the open for a rare exception, a long tail of extension cords snaking away from her to the cave and the diesel generator's three-prong outlet. He hung it over the mantle, using two hooks and a level to make sure that it came out perfectly even. Tony helped Alan install the shallow collectibles cases along the house's two-story stairwell, holding the level while Alan worked the cordless power driver. Alan's glazier had built the cases to Alan's specs, and they stretched from the treads to the ceiling. 
Allen filled them with made and occupied Japan tin toys, felt tourist pennants from Central Florida gator farms, a stone for Mary Laveau's tomb in the San Luis Juan Cemetery in New Orleans, tarnished brass zippos, small framed comic book bodybuilding ads, carved Polynesian coconut monkeys, melamine transistor radios, Bakelite snow globes, all the tchotchkes he'd accumulated over a lifetime of picking and hunting and digging. They were gloriously scuffed and non-mint. He'd always sold off the sterile mint and packaged goods quickly as he could, squirreling away the items that were marked property of Freddy Terrazzo in shaky ballpoint, the ones with tooth marks and frayed boxes taped shut with brands of sticky tape not offered for sale in fifty years. The last thing to go in was the cellar. They knocked out any wall that wasn't load-bearing, smeared concrete on every surface, and worked in a loose mosaic of blue, grass, blue glass and beach china, smooth and white and spidery blue illustrations as pale as a dream. Three coats of urethane made all the surfaces gleam. Then it was just a matter of stringing the cables for the clip-on halogens, whose beams he took care to scatter off the ceilings to keep the glare to a minimum. He moved in his horsehair sofa and armchairs, his big old bed, his pots and pans and sideboard with its novelty decanters, and his entertainment totem. A man from Bell Canada came out and terminated the data line in his basement, in a room that he'd outfitted with an uninterruptible power supply, a false floor, dry fire extinguishers, and a pipe brake sensor. He installed and configured the router, set up his modest rack and home servers, fi fished three four-pair wires through the living room, the den, and the attic, where he attached them to unobtrusive wireless access points, and thence to weatherproofed omnidirectional antennae made from copper tubing and PVC that he'd affixed to the building's exterior on short masts, aimed out over Kensington Market, blanketing a whole block with free internet access. He had an idea that the story he was going to write would require some perambulatory cogitation, and he wanted to be able to take his laptop anywhere in the market and sit down and write and hop online and check out little factoids with a search engine so he wouldn't get hung up on stupid details. The house on Wales Avenue was done. He'd repainted the exterior a lovely robin's egg blue, fixed the front step, and planted a low-maintenance combination of outsized rocks from the Canadian Shield and white wild grasses on the front lawn. On July 1st, Alan celebrated Canada Day by crawling out of the attic window onto the roof and watching the fireworks and listening to the collective sighs of the people densely packed around him in the market. Then he went back into the house and walked from room to room, looking for something out of place, some spot still rough and unsanded, and found none. The books and the collections lined the walls, the fans whirred softly in the ceilings, the filters beneath the open windows hummed as they sucked in the pollen and particulate out of the rooms. Alan's retail experience had convinced him long ago of the selling power of fresh air and street sounds, so he refused to keep the windows closed, despite the fantastic volume of city dust that blew in. The house was perfect. The economic marvel of a chair that, chair that UPS had dropped off the previous day was tucked under the wooden sideboard that he'd set up as a desk in the second floor den. His brand new computer sat centered on the desk, a top-of-the-line laptop with a wireless card and a screen big enough to qualify as a home theater in some circles. Tomorrow, he'd start the story. Alan rang the next door house's doorbell at 8 a.m., he had a bag of coffees from the Greek diner, five coffees, one for each bicycle locked to the wooden railing on the sagging porch, plus one for him. He waited five minutes, then rang the bell again, holding it down, listening for the sound of footsteps over the muffled jangling of the buzzer. It took two minutes more, he estimated, but he didn't mind. It was a beautiful summer day, soft and moist and green, and he could already smell the fish market over the mellow brown vapors of the steaming coffee. A young woman in long johns and a baggy tartan t-shirt opened the door. She was excitingly plump, round, and a little jiggly, the kind of woman Alan had always gone for. Of course, she was all of twenty-two, and so was certainly not an appropriate romantic interest for him, but she was fun to look at as she ungummed her eyes and worked the sleep out of her voice. Yes, she said through the lock screen door. Her voice worked no nonsense, which Alan also liked. He'd hire her in a second if he were still running a shop. He liked to hire sharp kids like her, get to know them, try to winkle out their motives and emotions through observation. "'Good morning,' Alan said. "'I'm Alan. I just moved in next door. I brought coffee!' He hefted his sack in her direction. "'Good morning, Alan,' she said. "'Thanks and all, but—' "'Oh, no need to thank me. Just being neighborly. I brought five, one for each of you and one for me.' 
Well, that's awfully nice of you. Nothing at all. Nice morning, huh? I just saw a robin there, on that tree in the park, not an hour ago. Fantastic. Great. She unlocked the screen door and opened it, reaching for the sack. Alan stepped into the foyer and handed it to her. There's cream and sugar in there, he said. Lots. Don't know how you folks take it, so I figured better sure than miserable, better to err on the side of caution. Wow, look at this. Your place is a completely different layout from mine. I think they were built at the same time. I mean, they look a lot alike. I don't know much about architecture, but they really do seem the same, don't they, from the outside? But look at this. In my place, I've got a long corridor before you get to the living room, but your place is all open. I wonder if it was built that way, or if someone did that later. Do you know? No, she said, hafting the sack. Well, I'll just have a seat while you get your roommates up, all right? Then we can all have a nice cup of coffee and a chat and get to know each other. She dithered for a moment, then stepped back towards the stairwell and the, the kitchen and the stairwell. Ellen nodded and took a little tour of the living room. There was a very nice media totem, endless shelves of DVDs and videos, including a good selection of kung fu Chinese D VCDs and black and white comedies. There was a stack of guitar magazines on the battered coffee table, and a cozy sofa with an afghan folded neatly on one arm. Good kids, he could tell that just by looking at their possessions. Not very security conscious, though. She should have either kicked him out or dragged him around the house while she got her roomies out of bed. He thought about slipping some VCDs into his pocket and returning them later, just to make the point, but decided it would be getting off on the wrong foot. She returned a moment later, wearing a fuzzy yellow robe whose belt and seams were grey with grime and wear. "'They're coming down,' she said. "'Terrific,' Alan said, and planted himself on the sofa. "'How about that coffee, hey?' She shook her head, smiled a little, then retrieved a coffee for him. "'Cream? Sugar?' Nope, Alan said. The Greek makes it just the way I like it, black and strong and aromatic. Try some before you add anything. It's really fantastic. One of the, be one of the best things about the neighborhood, if you ask me. Another woman, rail thin with a shaved head, baggy jeans and a tight t-shirt that he could count her ribs through, suffled, shuffled into the living room. Alan got to his feet and extended his hand. Hi there, I'm Adam, your new neighbor. I brought coffees. She shook his hand, her long fingernails sharp on his palm. Natalie, she said. The other young woman passed a coffee to her. He brought coffee, she said. Try it before you before you add anything to it. She turned to Alan. I thought you said your name was Alan. Alan, Adam, Andy, doesn't matter. I answer to any of them. My mom had a hard time keeping our name street, straight. Funny, Natalie said, sipping at her coffee. Two sugars, three creams, she said, holding her hand out. The other woman silently passed them to her. I haven't got your name yet, Alan said. Right, the other one said. You sure haven't. A young man, all of seventeen, with straggly sideburns and a shock of pink hair sticking straight up in the air, shuffled into the room wearing cutoffs and an unbuttoned guillabera. Adam, Natalie said, this is Link, my kid brother. Link, this is Arthur. He brought coffees. Hey, thanks, Arthur, Link said. He accepted his coffee and stood by his sister, sipping reverently. So that leaves one more, Alan said, and then we can get started. Link snorted. Not likely. Krishna doesn't get out of bed before noon. Krishna, Alan said. My boyfriend, the nameless woman said. He was up late. More coffee for the rest of us, I suppose, Alan said. Let's all sit and get to know one another then, shall we? They sat. Alan slurped down the rest of his coffee, then just at the sack. The nameless woman passed it to him, and he got the last one and set to drinking. I'm Andreas, your, next, your new next-door neighbor. I've just finished renovating, and I moved in last night. I'm really looking forward to spending time in the neighborhood. I work from home, so I'll be around a bunch. Feel free to drop by if you need to borrow a cup of sugar or anything. That's so nice of you, Natalie said. I'm sure we're all going to get along fine. Thanks, Natalie. Are you a student? Yup, she said. She fished in the voluminous pockets of her jeans, tugging them lower on her knobbly hips, then came up with a pack of cigarettes. She offered one to her brother, who took one, and one to Alan, who declined, then lit up. Studying fashion design at OCAD. I'm on my last year, so it's all practicum from now on. Fashion? How interesting, Alan said. I used to run a little vintage clothes shop in the beaches called Tropical. Oh, I love that shop, she said. You had the best stuff. I used to sneak out there on the streetcar after school. Yup. He didn't remember her exactly, but her type, sure. Solo girls with hardcover sketchbooks and vintage clothes home tailored to a nice fit. Well, I'd be happy to introduce you to some of the people I know. There's a vintage shop in the, that a friend of mine runs in Parkdale. He's always looking for designers to help with rehab and repros. That would be so cool. Now, Link, what do you study? 
Link pulled at his smoke, ashed in the fireplace grate. Not much. I didn't get into Ryerson for electrical engineering, so I'm spending a year as a bike courier, taking night classes, and reapplying for next year. Well, that'll keep you out of trouble at least, Alan said. He turned to the nameless woman. So what do you do, Apu? she said to him, before he could say anything. Oh, I'm retired, Mimi, he said. Mimi, she said. Why not? It's as good a name as any. Her name is... Link started to say, but she cut him off. Mimi is as good a name as any. I'm unemployed. Krishna is a bartender. Are you looking for work? She smirked. Sure, what you got? What can you do? Well, I've got three quarters of a degree in environmental studies, one year of kinesiology, and a half-written one-act play. Oh, and student debt till the year 3000. A play, he said, slapping his thighs. You should finish it. I'm a writer too, you know. I thought you had a clothing shop. I did, and a bookshop, and a collectible shop, and an antique shop. Not all, not all at the same time, you understand. But now I'm writing. I'm going to write a story, and then I imagine I'll open another shop. But I'm more interested in you, Mimi, and your play. Why have finished? She shrugged and combed her hair back with her fingers. Her hair was brown and thick and curly, down to her shoulders. Alan adored curly hair. He'd had a clerk at the comic shop with curly hair, just like hers, an earnest and bright, bright young thing who drew her own comics in the back room on her breaks, using the receiving table as a drawing board. She never made much of a go of it as an artist, but she did end up publishing a pair of popular... An but she did not uh, but she did end up publishing a popular annual anthology of underground comics that had captured the interest of the New Yorker the year before. I just ran out of inspiration, Mimi said, tugging at her hair. Well, there you are. Time to get inspired again. Stop by any time and we'll talk about it, all right? If I get back to it, you'll be the first to know. Tremendous, he said. I know that'll be fanta I just know that it'll be fantastic. Now, who plays the guitar? Krishna, Link said. I noodle a bit, but he's really good. He sure is, Alan said. He was in fine form last night about 3 a.m. He chuckled pointedly. There was an awkward silence. Alan slurped down his second coffee. Whoops, he said. I believe I need to impose on you for the use of your facilities. What? Natalie and Link said simultaneously. He wants the toilet, Mimi said. Up the stairs, second door on the right. Jiggle the handle after you flush. The bathroom was crowded with too many towels and too many toothbrushes. The sink was powdered with blusher and marked with lipstick and mascara residue. It made Alan feel at home. He liked young people, liked their energy, their resentment, and their enthusiasm. Didn't like their guitar playing at 3 a.m., but he'd sort that out soon enough. He washed his hands and carefully rinsed the long curly hairs from the bar before replacing it in its dish, then returned to the living room. Abel, Mimi said, sorry if the guitar kept you up last night. No sweat, Alan said, it must be hard to find time to practice if you work nights. Exactly, Natalie said, exactly right. Krishna always practices when he comes back from work. He blows off some steam so he can get to bed. We all just learn to sleep through it. Well, Alan said, to be honest, I was hoping I wouldn't have to learn to do that, but I think that maybe I have a solution we can both live with. What's that, Mimi said, jutting her chin forward. It's easy, really. I can put up a resilient channel and a baffle along that wall there. Soundproofing. I'll paint it over white. You won't even notice the difference. Shouldn't take me more than a week. Happy to do it. Thick walls make good neighbors. We really don't have any money to pay for renovations, Mimi said. Alan waved his hand. Who said anything about money? I just want to solve the problem. I'll do it to my side. I'd do it to my side of the wall, but I just finished renovating there. Mimi shook her head. I don't think the landlord would go for it. You worry too much, he said. Give me your landlord's number and I'll sort it out with them, all right? All right, Link said. That's terrific, Albert, really. All right, Mimi, Natalie? Natalie nodded enthusiastically, her shaved head whipping up and down on her thin neck precariously. Mimi glared at Natalie and Link. I'll ask Krishna, she said. All right, then, Alan said. Let me measure up the wall and I'll start shopping for supplies. He produced a matte black, egg-shaped digital tape measure and started shining pinpoints of laser light on the wall, clicking the egg's buttons when he had the corners tight. The Portuguese clerks at his favorite store had dissolved into hysterics when he proudly shown them the $300 gadget, but they were consistently impressed by the exacting CAD drawings of his projects that he generated with its output. Natalie and Link stared in fascination as he did his think with more s thing with more showmanship than was technically necessary, though Mimi made a point of rolling her eyes. Don't go spending any money yet, cowboy, she said. I've still got to talk to Krishna, and you've still got to talk to the landlord. He fished in the breast pocket of his jean jacket and found a little stub of pencil and a steno pad, and scribbled his cell phone number and tore off the sheet. 
He passed the sheet, pad, pencil, pad and pencil to Mimi, who wrote out the landlord's number and passed it back to him. Okay, Alan said. There you go. It's been a real pleasure meeting you folks. I know we're all going to get along great. I'll call your landlord right away, and you call me once Krishna's up, and I'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. to start construction. God willing, and the crick don't rise. Link stood and extended his hand. Nice to meet you, Albert, he said. Really, thanks for the muds, too. Natalie gave him a bony hug, and Mimi gave him a leap, limp handshake, and then he was out in the sunshine, head full of designs and logistics and plans. I guess that's enough for this week. Talk to you again next week.